Welcome everyone and this is lecture 20 of our series on fluids, electrolytes and acid-base disorders. This series of lectures accompany, explain and expand on the concepts explained in my book Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte and Acid-Base Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book which you can find on Amazon as an ebook and also as a paperback. I will provide information in the description. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. We are still on chapter 2, hypokalemia, and this is part 6, symptoms, complications, and diagnosis of hypokalemia. Let's get started. Symptoms and complications of hypokalemia. So most patients are not symptomatic if hypokalemia is mild. When you get symptoms, usually potassium is less than 3, 3 mL equivalents per liter or 3 millimoles per liter. The severity also is related to how fast the potassium is declining. I have to say that most symptoms of electrolytes disorders are nonspecific. You cannot tell sometimes if it's hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, or if it is hyponatremia or hypercalcemia. A lot of them are the same. So muscle weakness and fatigue are the most common, but you can see that in hyperkalemia. So you cannot tell if the potassium is high or low. This is why you have to check potassium. So both high and low potassium can result in muscle weakness. It starts in the lower extremities and then it goes up. Now, in severe hypokalemia, you can get flaccid paralysis. This is not really common. Also, in some severe cases, you can get rhabdomyolysis. So we have to be, uh, to, uh, to be careful about severe hypokalemia because it can lead to serious complications. Now, since hypokalemia causes muscle weakness, when this affects the GI tract, we're going to get sometimes ileus, nausea, vomiting, and complications. EKG or ECG changes in hypokalemia include inverted or flat T waves, ST segment depression, and the characteristic and the very well-known prominent U waves. Now, hypokalemia can result in palpitations, sometimes ventricular and supraventricular tachyarrhythmias. If the patient is on digitalis, which is not common, fortunately, nowadays, you can increase the likelihood of arrhythmias. Now, hypokalemia can cause renal manifestations. You can, you can have polyuria, polydipsia, and nephrogenic DI. I want to remind you of something. Low potassium and high calcium cause nephrogenic DI. Remember, low potassium, high calcium. Why? Because it suppresses, it decreases the effect of vasopressin or ADH on the collecting tubule. So you get nephrogenic DI. This is an example of the EKG in the first diagram. You see the prominent U wave. You see the ST segment inversion. Now, this sometimes can falsely give the impression of a prolonged QT interval. It's not prolonged. It's because of the U wave. Actually, you have a QU interval. So this is called pseudo-prolonged QT interval, as you can see in the second diagram. Now, this is what we call the push-pull effect. In hypokalemia, you're pushing the T wave down. So you have T wave inversion, ST depression, and a prominent U wave. In hyperkalemia, you have the famous characteristic peak T waves. The P wave is flattened and the PR interval is prolonged. This is going to lead to wide QRS complexes. Keep these two images in mind and refer to them frequently. U waves in hypokalemia and peak T waves in hyperkalemia. One, you're uh, in, in hypokalemia, you're actually pushing down. In hyperkalemia, you're pulling up. Now, chronic hypokalemia rarely can cause chronic tubular interstitial nephritis. I think I've seen one case. Hypokalemia can cause glucose intolerance because it decreases insulin secretion. 
Also, you can have psychological manifestations, depression, hallucinations, delirium, psychosis. This has to be severe, severe hypokalemia. How do we make the diagnosis? Well, that's easy. On any chemistry profile, we're going to get potassium. So uh, once we make the diagnosis, once we know that potassium is 3.5, we're going to have to determine the etiology. We have to determine why the patient is hypokalemic and do we need to do further testing. So first we need a history because most patients with hypokalemia either lose potassium through the GI tract or through the kidneys. Pseudo-hypokalemia is not common. Starvation, anorexia is obvious and also not very common. Um, albuterol insulin can cause a transient shift redistribu redistribution in potassium but not chronic hypokalemia. Uh, so really our focus is on renal loss or GI loss. Now, vomiting and diarrhea are the most common GI causes. Also laxative abuse, anyone who would induce vomiting, bulimia, anorexia nervosa like we talked about, while diuretics are the most common renal etiology. I want you to remember like a triangle, potassium in the, in the middle or hypokalemia in the middle and you have vomiting, diarrhea, diuretics, okay? Remember these things. If you want to call it, call it VDD, vomiting, diarrhea, diuretics. These are the three common causes and maybe add hypomagnesemia if uh, low potassium is recalcitrant. We're going to focus on blood pressure, on volume status, and musculoskeletal exam when we are doing our physical exam. If the cause of hypokalemia is not immediately clear from the history, like someone who's vomiting, who's having diarrhea, who's on a diuretic, we do a 24-hour urine collection for potassium. If the loss of potassium is through the GI tract, the kidneys are going to preserve potassium. So urine potassium is going to be less than 30 milliequivalents per 24 hours. On the other hand, if the kidneys are the cause, if the patient is wasting potassium in the urine, then your potassium is going to be 30 or above milliequivalents or millimoles. Now, if we cannot do a 24-hour urine collection, we can do a random urine potassium to creatinine ratio. If we are using uh, the standard units, the SI units is going to be over 1.5 millimole of potassium to millimole of creatinine. That will mean renal loss. Or if it's over 13 milliequivalents of potassium to gram of creatinine, um, then that indicates uh, renal loss. Other tests sometimes are needed, like urine electrolytes if we are suspecting renal tubular acidosis or diarrhea. I'll talk about that when we discuss metabolic acidosis. Sometimes we check plasma renin activity and plasma aldosterone if we are suspecting aldosteronism. If you are thinking about rhabdomyolysis, well, obtain creatine kinase. If the patient is having arrhythmias, obtain an EKG. If the patient is having GI loss due to diarrhea or laxatives, their serum bicarb is going to be low due to non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Patients with vomiting are going to be alkalotic. Because they have metabolic alkalosis, their serum bicarb is going to be elevated. Now, if you do urine studies, if you do urine electrolytes on someone with vomiting, their urine chloride is going to be low. Urine sodium can be high because they have a lot of bicarb in the urine and that uh, can have the sodium with it. So check urine chloride. On a test, if you see a patient, or in real life, doesn't matter, if you see a patient with low potassium, metabolic alkalosis, and low urine. Chloride, think of vomiting. If you answer the question quickly on the test, send me a thank you note. Put that in the comments. Now, if diuretic abuse is suspected, you, you can order a urine diuretic screen. Um, sometimes a clue to that is inconsistent values of random urine potassium creatine ratio. So right after taking a diuretic, the ratio is going to be high due to renal wasting of potassium. Now, after uh, if, if it's been hours since taking the last diuretic dose, it's going to be low. So you have this variability. Now, let's look at this flow chart. This is the only flow chart I have in the book. I'm not a big fan of flow charts, but here it was inevitable. How do we go about the diagnosis? So first, we're going to check serum potassium. If it's less than 3.5 milliequivalents per liter or millimole per liter, we have a diagnosis of hypokalemia. 
replace the potassium orally or intravenously or both, depending on the situation, and check magnesium and replace it if it is low. Now, what's the next step? The next step, you're going to do a 24-hour urine potassium or random urine potassium creatinine ratio. If the cause is GI, the kidneys are going to preserve potassium. Therefore, 24-hour urine potassium is going to be less than 30 mL globulins or a ratio less than 1.5 millimole per millimole. So in that case, think of GI loss, diarrhea, vomiting, NG suction, laxatives abuse, um, sometimes maybe a shift due to insulin or albuterol or discontinued diuretics. On the other hand, if the cause of hypokalemia is renal loss, 24-hour urine collection is going to show high potassium, over 30, or let's say equal or, or over 30. Um, in that case, when you have renal loss, you have two big categories. Either blood pressure is normal or blood pressure is high. Now, when blood pressure is normal, we look at serum CO2. If you have a blood gas, this is even better. If you have a low serum CO2, maybe you have renal tubular acidosis. That can give you metabolic acidosis. Of course, it's not a 9-gap plus hypokalemia, but blood pressure is normal. Now, if serum CO2 is elevated with low urine chloride, what do we have? Vomiting. Never forget that, okay? Now, if serum CO2 is high, meaning you have metabolic alkalosis, and urine chloride is high, think of low magnesium, diuretics, and Barter's and Gittleman syndrome. Like I said, Barter's syndrome has the same effects like being on a loop diuretic. So blood pressure would be normal, you have metabolic alkalosis, and you have hypokalemia. Now, Gittleman syndrome is the same like being on a thiazide diuretic. So you're going to have normal blood pressure, metabolic alkalosis, hypokalemia, and you have low urine calcium, hypocalciuria. Now, the second category is renal loss of potassium plus high blood pressure. Now, here, when we need to measure renin and plasma aldosterone, and we have three possibilities. If the renin is high, meaning plasma renin activity is high, and that led to high aldosterone. So we started with the renin, that led to high aldosterone. We should think of malignant hypertension, which is usually obvious. You have very high blood pressure, renovascular hypertension, or renin secreting tumors. Now, if you have high aldosterone, which led to suppressed renin, so we started with high aldosterone and now low renin, suppressed, then think of primary aldosterone and then you go through the usual ways and recommendations about its diagnosis. Now, if both are low, renin is low and aldo is low, think of Cushing syndrome. Usually the diagnosis can be obvious from body habitus, other tests too. Uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, mineralocorticoid intake, someone who is taking uh, mineralocorticoids, and little syndrome, which uh, we discussed um, in the previous uh, lecture. It's a genetic cause of uh, hypertension. I'm going to uh, stop here. Uh, see you in the next lecture.